right, I I am ready to make my first video. Uh, I, uh, my sexy shirt. Well, uh, but before I do that, let me let me check YouTube. Son of a bitch. What's up? I'm back. Skip the intro. It's too long. The Cinefix video is mostly about the technical aspects, so they don't really go in depth on the cinematography. So there. And I'm not just salty because they got to finish their video before me, and uh, that's not the reason why I'm only now making this video. Before Inception, the centrifuges were mostly used in sci-fi to show how artificial gravity works, like in 2001. But it wasn't very common among other genres, and I can't think of a film that used centrifuges for an action set piece before this one. But plenty after it. This scene is almost entirely responsible for the rapid increase of centrifuge usage in the next four years, but why? What is it about this film that makes it so captivating? Well, the second worst YouTube channel already explained why, but not all of it. I can explain more. No salt. Well, it starts off already pretty exciting with Joseph Gordon-Levitt finding himself next to Paige, among others, in deep sleep with kicking music in the background. Notice how while this room is better than most hotel rooms I've been in, it still somehow feels a bit uncomfortable, mostly due to the brownish lighting. Not not being very bright, but bright enough for you to see what's happening. It was very difficult for them to put studio lights in the set, so they just used normal lamps. Uh, God, I, I need studio lights too. And did it just break? No, it didn't break. Also, there are a lot of squares in this room. The tiles are square, the texture on the blanket is square, the night lights are squarish, the emergency exit map on the door is square, the picture looks squarish, though I'm not quite sure it's at an angle. I just, actually, I just noticed it's not just squares that are everywhere. Pretty much everything here has a 90 degree angle. Even Ellen Page's legs are bent at 90 degrees. It's a sort of theme in this dream layer. My guess as to why that's the case is for two reasons. The first one is to showcase that uh, Joseph Gordon Levitt really likes order and the second reason is uh, to foreshadow that something isn't gonna be right in the next few seconds with something very established like gravity. So then we cut to the car chase and we find ourselves in a completely different color palette. In the first dream layer the dominating color is blue, in the second brown, third white. This is brilliant because it provides an easy way to understand where the action takes place without any unnecessary dialogue. Wait, is that guy real or a dummy? It's it's so awesome when you can't tell. So then they fire at the car and similarly Levitt starts dreaming about being in danger. Yes, it's true, the film does give a very vague uh, antibody explanation, but I'm sure it's a mixture of both that and what I just said. Levitt leaves the room and walks towards the lift as it opens in a comedic fashion and the fight begins. I just love everything about this two second Bond like bit where the dude is shooting at the audience. Yes, I know Bond wasn't the first one to use this kind of a shot, but he was the one that popularized it. I love how the set is almost symmetrical but not quite, just like a face, and how just before we cut away the gun is at roughly the same angle as both the shoulder and the first gap on the wall, while the waist is at the same level as the second gap. And look, his back is at the same level as the gap between the elevator doors. And how just before he fires, we cut to another guy firing. I wonder how many takes did it take for them to make this shot. Or was it an accident? Who knows. Anyway, we cut to this random goon loading his gun before getting into his car and crashing it into the bus just like Cinefix is gonna crush on Social Blade one day. This not only explains where the car came from, but also expands the world. The guy in the bus fucks up and the car first receives a lot of centrifugal force before rolling over. As a result, Levitt and the nameless guy feel as if gravity is shifting and here's the best part. You remember I told you about these gaps on the wall? Well, there are also lines on the ground as well and there are no accident this time. These lines are there to show you where the vanishing point is and by completing them, we can see where the target is. On this motherfucker, Levitt is running through words while the camera shakes just a little bit for dramatic effect. Why is this important? Well, if you have lines radiate from where these guys are, it's easier for your eyes to focus on them, on those two people, and pay less attention on the surroundings, which can distract you from what's happening on the screen. And what makes this even better is that while most of the sequence has consisted of shorter cuts, this one is long by comparison, making the magic of the visual effects sink in. This scene does not need any exciting cuts or any CGI, it just needs an amazing practical effect for your eyes to marvel at, and everybody, including Nolan and the editor, knew it. So then they fall into this room, and this is where things got a little bit dangerous, because the distance between the walls is much wider than the distance between the ground and the ceiling. But they still did it on cam, with as few cam tricks as possible. Yeah, I, I don't really have anything to say at this point other than that the scene makes falling sheets of paper epic. But the one thing I can't praise enough is the music. Hans Zimmer is known for making 
almost laughable overly epic music and this is no exception but this is an instance where it works as it blends the ridiculousness of his style with actually some decent stuff unlike Cinefix. This matches with what's going on on screen because that too is a mixture between absurdity and obviously hard but well done work from every party involved. Well... Just before the scene ends, we have this distracting mistake as we see an obvious dummy being shown at another before cutting to the actors in a completely different position, but, and, you know, it, it also works because, you know, it, it's a dream and in dreams anything can happen. Okay, fine. It, it is a mistake, but it's a small mistake in an otherwise perfect sequence. This whole sequence is a great example of directing, editing, uh, set designing, uh, fight choreography, uh, acting, uh, anything, everything, un unlike Cinefix. At times it does feel a little bit overdone, but it's still good because not only does it look amazing, but it also adds excitement that's possible only in films and dreams. And with that break of ice, after three minutes of silence, I'm out. Check out my other videos, subscribe, follow me on Twitter, thanks. and presumably can see if something doesn't make any sense. The fact that they made a mistake in an anime show is unforgivable.